Welcome to Freedom Church of the Black Hills. We're so blessed and honored that you chose to worship with us today. You know, as we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, the Bible tells us in Psalms 22.3 that God inhabits the praises of his people. So no matter where you're at, whether you're at home or whether you're in your car or work, or whether you're out in the middle of the woods, God is with you. So let's lift up our voices and let's sing and honor him. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, moving in our midst, I worship you.
you're joining us today as we start a brand new series called you can bank on it and i believe in this series that god is going to be speaking to us his church about his word the word that we can stand on the word that has stood the test of time it was relevant when it was written and spoken thousands of years ago and it is relevant today i'm going to say that again it is relevant today can i get an amen it never is stale. It never goes out of date. It never spoils like a gallon of milk. It is fresh and fulfilling for those that hunger for it. That's right. It's our daily bread. It's something that we need to consume on a daily basis so we know what God says. We know the truth. I remember when I was growing up, a handshake was, and someone's word was something that you could rely on most of the time. I would watch as neighbors would help neighbors, and I promised to help held value. And very seldom did someone ever back out on their word. Today, your head will spin in circles on what to believe. The news stations and other media are more worried about the ratings and agendas and political parties than they are the truth. It's almost like a weather forecast. You can't believe what they're going to say until you stick your head out the window and look up in the sky. We see diets and health reports. In March, they say, eat this specific food, take this supplement, do this, exercise this way to reduce high blood pressure or whatever. And then by October, the new report comes out that you shouldn't be eating that much of this food. Uh, it has very little benefit. And the said medication may now cause other issues. The side effects might even be more complicated and cause more problems and are worse for you than the initial problem you had. We are fed so many lies that a glimpse of the truth is hidden in that story somewhere. Motives and money have destroyed the trust of so, so many. We vote on people in the office based on promises and what they stand for, only to realize that their agenda does not meet up with their word or their promises. In the rise of technology advancements, video and photos are altered. Everyone is airbrushed with the perfect tan and not a hair out of place. Better yet, I could even have hair. You get the point. You know what I'm talking about. What do we believe? When words and handshakes have failed and people fail people in society, society has turned to contracts. Contracts came into play after many people failed on their portion of an agreement or words held less and less value. In order to protect the interest of the parties, contracts and legal lingo have now become the norm. But even this has failed. In the court systems are full of proceedings from broken contracts and failed promises. We really have a trust issue. We really have a truth issue. We have become a society where more and more prenups come into play before a couple ever walks down the aisle. Sad but true, love is even affected or infected by this value 
or should I say the lack of value in our words, trust and truth. Today, we are inundated with spam and scams, fishing for ways to get our identity, account numbers, and wanting to give us something that just seems too good to be true. I don't know how many phone calls I get on a daily basis, potential spam, or they want to sell me this, or it's an automated thing right away when you pick it up. It gets annoying. Or even the offers in the mail. You just get pummeled with so many things. This offer and that offer. You know, we'll give you this great rate. Yeah, you will. And then at the end, they jack up the price. You don't know what to believe. It's all motivated by money and greed, and it can ruin so many lives. This is also true for Victor Lustig. He was not a victim. That's right. He was a con artist. Born July 4th, 1890 in Austrian Hungary, he was especially gifted at learning throughout his youth. But his wealth of knowledge also proved to be a source of trouble for him. He didn't go down the right path. He used his smarts, his brains, for other people's agony, other people's demise. At the age of 19, while taking a break from his studies in Paris, Victor took up gambling. Upon leaving school, he applied his education and his fluency in several languages to embark on a life of crime, eventually focusing on conducting a variety of scams and cons to provide him with property and money. He looked around and said, you know what? I'm smarter than this guy. I can take them of their money. His criminal record took him across Europe and to the United States during the early 20th century. Victor Lustig is widely regarded as one of the most notorious con artists of his times. Many of his initial crimes were committed on ocean liners sailing between the ports of France and New York City, pulling off schemes on rich travelers, including one in which he posed as a musical producer and sought investors in a non-existing Broadway production. He got the money when he was on the ship, they landed in New York City, and he took off with it. In 1925, Victor traveled back to France while staying in Paris. He came upon a newspaper article discussing the problems faced with maintaining the Eiffel Tower, the iconic Eiffel Tower in France, which gave him inspiration on his new con. At the time, the monument had become uh, to had become so um, fall in disrepair that the city was finding increasingly expensive to maintain and repaint it on a regular basis. Part of the article made passing comments that the overall public opinion on the monu monument would move towards uh, having it removed or having it tore down, which was the key to convince Victor that using it as part of his next con would be very lucrative. If it was in the newspaper, he was going to take it and twist it around. And that's exactly what he did. In fact, after researching and uh, needing some help to utilize the information from this article, Victor set out work and uh, preparing the scam. He included hiring an outside help to produce fake government stationery just for him and his scam. Once he was ready, Victor invited a small group of scrap metal dealers uh, to a confidential meeting at an expensive hotel, whereupon he identified himself as the deputy director general in the meeting. He convinced the men that the upkeep of the Eiffel Tower had become too much for Paris and that the French government wished to sell it for scrap. But... Um, because of such a deal would be such controversy and likely uh, spark public outcry, nothing could be disclosed or discussed outside of this meeting until all the details were thought out. Victor revealed that he was in charge of selecting the dealer and he would receive ownership 
and they would receive ownership of the structure, claiming that the group uh, had been selected carefully because of their reputation of being honest businessmen. Come on, right there might have been a clue. His speech included genuine insight of the monument's place in the city and how it did not fit into the city's other great monuments like the Gothic cathedrals. Now, during his time with the dealers during this meeting, Victor was looking on who would most likely fall for his scam. The victim, Andre Pojan, an insecure businessman who wished to rise up among the inner circle of the business community, as Pojan showed the keenest interest in purchasing the monument, the Eiffel Tower. Victor decided to focus on him once the other dealers had sent in their bids. Arranging a private meeting with Pujan, Victor convinced him that he was a corrupt official, claiming that his government position did not give him a generous salary for the lifestyle he wished to enjoy, believing that the sale of the Eiffel Tower would secure him in a better place. Poijan agreed to pay him a large bribe and in, and in that secured the ownership of the Eiffel Tower. That's right, the Eiffel Tower, the icon of France, Paris, France. However, once uh, Victor received his bribe, his funds for the monument sale, which was around 70,000 francs or what would be equivalent to $1.1 million today, he soon fled to Austria. Victor suspected that Poijan, uh, once he found out that he had been conned, that he would be too ashamed and embarrassed to inform the French police of what he had been caught up in. Yet despite uh, this belief, he maintained and checked the newspapers while in Austria. His suspicion soon proved to be correct, that the, he could find no reference of the con uh, within its pages. And thus, he returned back to Paris later, about a year later, to guess what? Pull off the same scheme again. However, when Victor attempted to con another group of dealers, he uh, managed to find one more victim. However, before the sale of the Eiffel Tower, the police were informed of the scam and he had to flee to the United States to evade arrest. He continued his life of scam and schemes until his arrest in 1935 and spent his last 12 years in prison until he contracted pneumonia and died in 1947. With people like Victor, no wonder we have a hard time believing a word people say. Truth is twisted in every way, shape, form, or fashion. Unfortunately, this is nothing new in the world of deceit. We see this in Genesis chapter 3 with the fall of man in the garden of uh, in the garden with Adam and Eve and the serpent. Crafty and slick, the serpent fooled them into disobeying what God had spoken. They listened to the father of lies. The sinful nature of Victor and us would never have happened if the scam in the garden had never taken place. Outside of this, we see other stories of deceit among even family. If you would, turn with me to Genesis chapter 25. Jacob, the son of Isaac and the father of the twelve tribes of Israel, was characterized in this early life as a scammer. His very name, Jacob, heel catcher, subplanner, cheater, defrauder, deceiver. He received this name when uh, his mother gave birth to him and his twin brother, Esau. Esau was born first, yet Jacob was holding on to his heel of his brother, hence the name Heel Catcher. Now, the boys grew up totally opposite. Esau became a skillful, a skillful hunter, uh, a man of open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents. Their father loved the taste of wild game, and Isaac loved Esau. And their mother, Rebekah, showed favor and loved Jacob. Talk about a house divided. So here we go, Genesis chapter 25, starting in verse 29. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, 
First, tell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Basically, he was giving up his inheritance in a position to be next in line of being in charge of the family, the hierarchy. He must have, that must have been some good stew. That's all I got to say. Are you really that hungry, that starving? He couldn't have been. However, he just gave it up so quickly and so flamboyantly. And talk about a hangry issue? Come on. He should have had a Snickers bar or something. Jacob was fully aware of the prophecy concerning him and his brothers that was given to him at birth. The prophecy, God's word, predicted that Jacob would be the leader of the family. That Jacob would had a promise ahead of him, waiting for him. Genesis 25, 23 says, The Lord said to her, speaking about or speaking to Rebekah, Two nations are in your womb. The two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Not how it usually is in the family dynamics, right? It's usually the older has more privileges, more rights, and is usually the one in charge, but not in this case. God's word said otherwise. Esau had a sinful character that disqual disqualified him from the birthright blessing. The Lord was going to give the blessing to Jacob at the right time. But Jacob took matters into his own hands. Jacob's uh, proposal to his brother was pretty shameful. I mean, come on. You don't care about your brother or anybody in your family if you're going to be doing that. It showed a spirit of impatience and a lack of faith in God's word and the power of that the truth holds. He didn't believe in the prophecy. He was like, well, if I do believe it, I'm not going to wait for it. And so many times in our lives, we don't wait for things. We're, we're waiting. We know that God's going to open up a door. We're pushing on doors. We're pushing on them, hoping that they'll just open. We're like, nope, can't wait on you, Lord. I'm going to do it myself. The lack of trust. The lack that we don't believe in God's word. But it doesn't stop there. Later on, Jacob did another scam, even arranged uh, and encouraged by his mother. This time, he took advantage of his father Isaac's poor eyesight and failing health to ensure that not only did he receive the birthright inheritance, but he received his father's blessing. Isaac had requested a tasty meat prepared how he liked it uh, when he would give him his blessing before he died. So to make a, his father think that it was that he was Esau, Jacob put on Esau's clothes and put uh, goat skin on his arms to make his arms feel hairy, just like his brothers. Why the clothes? Well, when you got poor eyesight or something else, uh, one of your other senses is, is out. Your other senses are more likely to be enhanced, and therefore the clothes smelled like Esau. Genesis chapter 27 verse 19 is where we're going to read. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done all you have told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so you can give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, how did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord, your God, gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he blessed him. Are you really my son Esau? He, he asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, My son, bring me some of your game to eat, so that I may give you my blessing. 
Jacob brought it to him and he ate. And he brought some wine and, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. He goes on to say the blessing over Jacob, thinking this whole time that it was Esau. And when he was finished, Jacob slips out of the room, and shortly after, Esau returns from his hunt to prepare the food, just like his father had requested. He goes to his father and asks him to sit up to eat some of his game, so he may uh, give him his blessing. And Isaac asked, Who are you? And realized that Esau was now actually standing by his side. And it says in this verse, 33, Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it before you came, and I blessed him. And indeed, he will be blessed. Jacob did this once when he scammed and schemed uh, the birthright from Esau over some stew. And now he does it with his own father, which also affected Esau. People will go to great lengths to deceive people, even among family members, even among friends and co-workers, and yes, even among those within church. We are not exempt from the web of lies that started with the serpent in the garden. So what and who can we believe? We can believe in God's word, in the words of Jesus himself, the truth. When it comes to God's word and the truth, you and I can bank on it. That's right. You can bank on it. The term you can bank on it is a term used when you can expect something to happen. You are absolutely certain that something or you can rely on it happening. It's a 100% guarantee. 100% guarantee. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed. Proverbs 35 says, every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. From cover to cover, you can bet your life on every word that's in the Bible. You can bet your life on that it is so true. Every promise will happen. Every scam and scheme of darkness will be exposed to the light. Darkness cannot penetrate light, but light can break through darkness. I remember as a kid that sometimes I would climb in a box if I was going to play hide and go seek and close the lid. But if you were not, you were not really in total darkness because there was always a small crack in the corner or the flap wasn't fully closed and that light would always shine in. Scripture tells us that all sin will be exposed, that nothing is hidden from the Father. We can lie to people. People can lie to us. Politicians can lie. The news media can lie. They can take that little bit of truth and twist it all around. But God knows. You're not hiding anything from God. And he will expose it. 1 John 1, 5 says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by truth. Then in uh, verse 7, it says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Folks, if your fruit is shiny on the outside but rotten on the inside, you and I, or anyone else, is not living godly standards, principles, and standing on the word of God. The lies and deception will be exposed, and he promises it in his word. You can't hide it. And what people say should always line up with the Word of God, and if not, it's not going to bear good fruit. The good news about Jacob? He finally repented. He wrestled with God, 
but he finally repented of his sins and his deception, and the Lord forgave him, changed him completely, and transformed him in the renewing of his mind and his heart. His name was changed to Israel, and he no longer had the character trait of craftiness, selfishness, heartlessness. He possessed a new giving spirit, truthful spirit that honored God. I want to close this out today with the words of Jesus found in Luke chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. He is speaking to his disciples, to the masses, and in fact, it says many thousands. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. You can bank on God's word. You can bank on the truth that it holds. Don't fall for the lies of the enemy. Stand on God's word over your life and over your family. Put the words of others to the test. That's right. God's word. Put it up against God's word to see if it even lines up, to see if it even holds up. If it's dark, it will be exposed by God's light. Do this in all things. Stand on God's word because it is the truth. It is the 100% guaranteed the truth. The same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Let us pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you. Lord, we're, we thank you for your, your word that we can stand on. Your word that we can feed on daily. That, Lord, that we would recognize lies of the enemy. We would recognize lies and schemes. That, Lord, you would protect us from that. That, Lord, we would, we would hear you. Your Holy Spirit lead and guide us in everything we do and everything we put our hands to. That, Lord, there would be a protection over us and our families. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth and what it means to us. And in Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. Well, we never want to close out service without giving you the personal opportunity to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. All you have to do is say this very simple prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I know that I need a Savior. I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that your one and only Son, Jesus, died on the cross for my sins. That on the third day, he rose from that grave and is alive today. Lord, I ask you into my heart. I will live all the days of my life for you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. Now, if you said that very simple prayer today, congratulations. Heaven is celebrating and so are we. You made the best decision of your life. If you would, please contact us at the email below and let us know you made that decision today. We have some great resources we want to place in your hands and help you along this journey. Here at Freedom Church of the Black Hills, we exist to love God, love people, and love community. When you partner with us through the giving of your tithe and offering, you help us spread the good news of Jesus across the Black Hills and beyond. We have three simple ways that you can give. You can go to our website and use our secure giving tab. You can mail your gift to the address seen below. Or if you're in a host home today, you can use our secure giving box. Now, as you prepare your tithe and offering, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I just thank you for this day. And Jesus, Lord God, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have to come and to give into your kingdom. Father, we pray, Father, that you would touch this gift that we are giving to you. And Lord Jesus, that you would multiply it. God, that it would go into the kingdom and lives would be changed all to glorify your name. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Now, Thank you for your generosity, and we look forward to seeing you next week.